Karen Scholl. I work for Alaska Fire Service here in Fairbanks, Alaska. This year in the Upper Yukon Zone, we've had a, quite a few lightning strikes. We had a big bust in early July. It came originally known as the Chalkitsik Complex. We took it over. We had a, a series of 10 to 15 fires on the Chalkitsik Complex. And then later on when we came back, now we took over the Cornucopia Complex, which is uh, out near Beaver and Venati. And we had 20, 25 fires that we were responsible for monitoring as well as taking action on. We uh, did our in-briefing with the zone, got our marching orders. We went up there, uh, took a look at the values at risk. We knew right off what we had to deal with. We had village of Chalkitsik, uh, the river corridor on the Dranjik River, and we also had over a hundred native allotments uh, that were within our planning area and our protection area. So we had quite a bit of planning to do. We had a lot of resources we need to get moved out. In that time frame also, we were looking at some of the highest indices we've ever had in the state. So it was a big task. So with the native allotments in Alaska, we're charged with uh, full protection on these native allotments. They're selected land, generally on a riverway that provides either subsistence or fishing camps where folks go to get their food, hunting. People rely on it. You know, like on a river would be good fish fishnet area, and that's where they camp. That's why a lot of these allotments are just scattered all over the place, because that's where our grandpa and grandpa, grandma uh, raised us, you know, and that's where we came from. And I remember my grandmother, she was like about 85 years old. She'd sit on her knee all day in that smoky smokehouse and pluck ducks and, you know, cut fish and stuff like that. She was having a ball, and she, and she, and now you, you get it average person to have them sit there for 15 minutes, you barely get up, you know. I don't know how she did it all day. We weren't trying to do a full suppression on this fire. It was just too big. We were going after point protection, which means we're using a lot of indirect lines. And an indirect line is something that we put, uh, a line we put between the fire, main fire, and the value that we're trying to protect. It's generally put in in Alaska by hand crews. They go in, cut with chainsaws, thinning out, or actually removing all the fuels in a certain area. So you see really straight lines, which we like to fire off really straight lines. A lot of times we'll tie in a line to a waterway, to a water feature, and then connect the dots that way. And that gives us a line that we can burn off of. And what that means is we could light a fire off of that line to back into the main fire and thus stop the forward progression of the fire to the value at risk. We did put in a lot of lines out there that have not been used simply because the weather turned on us and so we got some precipitation to kind of slow down the fire and so the fire didn't make any more forward progress. So you'll see a lot of fire lines out there uh, that look like they're just out there for some odd reason. However, they could be used in the future and at the time they were necessary in order to prevent the fire from impacting the values at risk. Another tool that we have in our toolbox that we heavily use here in Alaska and we've embraced since uh, they first started coming out is the use of drones. And the drones that we're using mostly here are the tabletop size, the, the quadcopters as we call them. They've got video on board as well as a thermal camera and uh, specialized, we have a plastic sphere dispensing uh, drone set up that can drop uh, ping pong balls that ignite fuel um, and can be very precise with that. So when we have firing operations, instead of just using helicopters with the PSD under it, uh, dropping on large landscapes, we can be very specific with a drone carrying a PSD machine and put the incendiary device right where we want it to be um, and be real specific with what we're doing. In one instance down near Odig Lake on the allotment on the northeast corner of Odig Lake, uh, firefighters were getting ready to, to uh, come off the line and go into camp and uh, they sent the drone up to take a look around and see where the fire was and, uh, and make sure everything was sitting where they wanted it to be. What the drone saw was there was a big huge amount of uh, fire just off the line out of sight of firefighters on the ground and so it was able to pick up that man there's a lot of heat in this area that they hadn't really realized and it had it not been for uh, the drones you know things could have maybe gone a different way for us so we were able to keep firefighters out later 
uh, because the helicopters were already off for the evening, especially when we have adverse winds and they're blowing embers across our line. So they're blowing them in the wrong direction. And the operators of the drones can talk ground folks right into the exact spot and uh, pick them up when they're really, really small and take care of the, the spot fires and so they don't become an issue. The exciting part of the fires that everyone sees is when the flames are going and operational folks are out there fighting the fires. You see guys with Pulaski's and you see guys with hose and they're putting out fires and they're, and they're using the helicopters. The undersung heroes really of the fire in, environment are the logistical folks and what they're doing behind the scenes. So they're supplying us with everything that we need to survive out there, food, water, gas, equipment, and then at the end, that's all hauled back and given to them, and then they have to deal with it on the back end. We've been able to get a hose roller out to the Chalkitsik, so guys are rolling hose, crews are rolling hose, pulling it, putting it on airplanes, and hauling it back. The other things that we have, you know, the, the fixed wing and the aircraft that are going by, that's all backhaul, uh, trying to get everything that we can out of Chalkitsik and as quickly and efficiently as we can and uh, then back at the warehouse they're wrapping and strapping, they're washing everything, they're putting the kits back together after they've uh, run through all the equipment and they're getting ready for the next fire. This is what happened was we had a fire blow through, uh, we burned off, we had fire on the landscape and everything was looking great. About a day or two later we had a big windstorm, uh, and because our trees up here can't put down tap roots because of the because of the ice below, all these trees with this big heavy wind ended up blowing down. And so now you have what we call a jack straw situation. All these trees are just laid over on top of each other, and there's heat underneath them. And so crews have to go in and find that heat and put it out. One of the mop-up techniques that we use in Alaska, we use a technique we call bone piling. Fire line to the fire's edge. Uh, it's kind of a moving target. We don't necessarily go just 50 feet or 100 feet. It's re as required given the fuel types. And so the first day you might get 20 feet and you're walking that 20 feet and you're putting out all the hot spots. And then the next day you go in another 20 or 30 feet and you keep doing that until you get the depth you need. That shiny objects and there's a bunch of little buildings out there. That's all Bible camp. And then you can see the fire just to the west of there. Okay, so what we're looking at is an indirect hand line from the Yukon River to a slough that the crews were able to burn off of in order to stop the fire from advancing from the west. And the value at risk that was protected is the Bible camp. Aaron, how were they able to stop that slop over in the big thick, thick bruce there? So they got lucky with the weather. It was super windy ahead of a rain, a heavy rain. The wind pushed the fire across their line, and then the rain came and put it out, so they got some help. And the, at Bible Camp there, you can see there's an airstrip, so people fly in and out of there to support the Bible Camp with uh, food and delivering folks. Hello, my name is uh, Ed Sanford. I'm the incident commander with Alaska Incident Management Team. Weeks ago, we were actually the first incident management team in that area. Like uh, Karen said, in, in the operations, they came up with a good plan um, with the team and uh, secured the community of Shalkitsik from Otig Lake all the way up to the north. And that was a big win for us. As we transitioned out of that uh, incident and uh, we stabilized it, we kept the fire from moving um, to the north and to the west and the east and to the south, we uh, timed out. So the other Alaska incident management team came in, uh, Norm McDonald, incident commander that uh, they've been working for uh, for two weeks. And they stabilized the incident, mopped it up. And by the time we got back uh, off a of days off, uh, we got ordered back to the Chukaitsa complex. And at the same time, the Nemo team uh, was managing fires out western for Yukon, uh, near Vinatai, Beaver, um, with that team. By the time we got back up here, we were we were tasked to take on both complexes, Chalkitsa complex and the Cornucopia complex, which is a very, very vast area. In the 28 years I've uh, been in Alaska, um, working in fire from uh, working in the grounds, working on the hotshot crews, moving up to the initial attack programs and into you know, the management level. I was mentioned uh, Tom Kurth, the other IC with the Alaska team. Um, when I was up there looking at the fire behavior, watching the, 
you know, watching the pace, watching the team, watching all, everything go on out there and the rhythm um, and the fire behavior. So and being super dry, it was probably one of the extremest fire uh, behavior I've seen in my career. And as a team and at the forward operating base in Chalkitsuk areas, we were really looking at making sure that we were putting uh, firefighters that were going to be successful and not put them in a place that would be dangerous. In managing that part of it all um, and bringing that all together, it uh, was successful from protecting the cabins and along the river because a lot of these fires were pushing hard down towards the rivers. And, you know, going in there and uh, starting up the pumps around cabins um, that we didn't want to leave firefighters in there. We went in there and started the pumps up. Um, got everything wet down, pulled them back out of there with the helicopters, put them in a safe area, let the flame front go through there, and then come back in there and uh, mop up the hot spots around the cabins, and the cabins were safe. On behalf of myself, incident commander, and uh, the Alaska team, I want to thank uh, Alaska Fire Service, um, specifically uh, UIT Dispatch, uh, AICC, um, the warehouse, all the pilots and uh, planes that supported our missions out there and safely doing that. And I want to thank uh, the folks of uh, Fort Yukon, uh, Beaver and Venati, and uh, folks from uh, Chalkitsik and supporting our mission with all the boat operators, all the truck drivers, all the ATV support, all the uh, aviation support and logistics, loading those planes, offloading those planes, helping us with food, helping us, the firefighters, get up and down the river safely, knowing everything is out there. And again, for myself and Alaska team, I want to say thank you. Matsicho.